Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, a free site, bettingangle.us, a free site. Today is February the 13th, 2020. Let's talk boxing, but first remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, let me just say, there's total chaos here in the background, even more off camera. I actually move tomorrow, right? So the notes I had for this video somehow got packed someplace, right? I live with a few people and uh, as you can imagine, stuff gets moved without me knowing. So, without any notes, let's talk about the rematch, and it's a big rematch. This is one of those fights that does not come around that often. It is the unbeaten, reigning WBC heavyweight champion Deontay Wilder against unbeaten lineal champion Tyson Fury. Right now, I know that upsets a lot of people. People say, how could Fury be the lineal when he was unable to defend the title he won against Vladimir Klitschko? I also sense the blowback that I've gotten here online, and I appreciate the blowback, right? This is a free speech zone. This is a safe zone for boxing fans here. When I say that Deontay Wilder, who's been heavyweight champion for five years, five years, who's fought the lineal, knocked him down twice, who quite frankly has knocked out or knocked down or stopped every man he's faced as a professional fighter. I know it upsets some people when I say that if I had a vote, in my opinion, Deontay Wilder is a Hall of Famer. But make no bones about it. This fight is an opportunity for both men to remove any doubt, any doubt about their credibility. Right? If Wilder wins this fight, he will have beaten the lineal champion. He will have beaten the guy who beat Vladimir Klitschko when Klitschko was closer to his prime than he was when he fought Anthony Joshua. Understand, only one fighter between Joshua and Fury fought Vladimir Klitschko when Klitschko was champion. And that was Tyson Fury. Right? Understand, too. It's very hard to argue with an unbeaten record. Now, longtime viewers here know I personally felt that Tyson Fury, even hitting the canvas twice, won the first fight by multiple rounds. But 10 years from now, 15 years from now, all anyone's going to know if Wilder wins this fight is that Wilder knocked him down two times the first fight. That the second knockdown, let's be charitable here, caused Fury to be on the canvas for what? At least nine seconds. That both of Fury's shoulders were on the canvas. During the count, Jack Reese, the referee, could have said I've seen enough. I'm here in the ring with you guys. I saw how hard you were hit. Right? If a fighter who's unbeaten, who's been heavyweight champion, who has beaten the mandatories for years, we can blame the WBC all we want on who the mandatory was. Understand, the champion didn't pick the mandatories. The sanctioning body did. Right? <laughs> you know, if Dylan White has a beef, and I agree, Dylan White's an elite fighter, but if he has a beef, that beef should be more with the sanctioning body, shouldn't it? 
right? If Deontay Wilder wins this fight, especially if he does it by KO, then he's a surefire Hall of Famer. Even if he runs into a car crash later, let's say he loses to Anthony Joshua. Right? The bottom line would have been that he had a five-year reign. And during that five-year reign, he knocked out every man he faced. He beat the lineal. Right? Hard to argue with those credentials. But make no mistake. I want to be as clear as I can be in this video. Right? When I think of great heavyweights, and I've been around long enough where I've seen some great heavyweights, when I think of great heavyweights, I don't think of Deontay Wilder. I'll be blunt. Right? For me, Personally, going back more than 20 years, right? When I say the word great heavyweight, you have to be two-handed. You have to have risen to the occasion where in some fights against formidable competition, you showed that you were the best man in the building. Right, when I think of great heavyweights, I think of a fight I was on the wrong side of betting wise. I think of Andrew Galata getting blown out, getting literally swept away. This is after Galata fought Riddick Bo Tough twice. I think of Andrew Galata getting blown away in the first round by Lennox Lewis. I think of all the hype, and I'm telling you there was a lot of hype, <clears throat> surrounding David Tua, who looked like he was the next Mike Tyson. And then I remember that fight, Lennox Lewis keeping him at the end of a jab. Tua looked like an amateur, couldn't come close to Lewis. Lewis, as great as his left hook was, as great as his right hand was, didn't need either. Just jabbed his way to an easy victory. I think of Michael Grant. People thought Michael Grant was the next. He was unbeaten at the time. He faces Lennox Lewis. That fight ended early. I remember Lewis doing real advanced stuff. I encourage people to look at the film. Doing things like holding Grant's hands as he's hitting him. Now I'm not saying those punches should have been allowed, nor should Lewis's pushing of Mike Tyson have been allowed. Right? Lewis was an edgy fighter. But let's just say he got results. Right? Repeatedly. Right? Lewis. Razor Ruddick. We thought Razor Ruddick was a beast at the time. Right? Now, I'll agree. This is boxing. Lewis had some off nights. That first Oliver McCall fight, he lost it. The first Haseem Rockman fight, he lost it. Make no mistake, I would not hesitate to take prime Len Lennox Lewis over prime Deontay Wilder. No hesitation from me whatsoever, right? I saw both Lennox Lewis and Vander Holyfield fights. Lewis beats him twice. Not as, well, as a great fighter who deserves induction in the Hall of Fame. James Tony did, right? Tony, master counterpuncher, master technician. But Lewis beats him twice. The first time they called it a draw, I don't care. I even saw Lewis against Vitaly Klitschko, right? Should have lost his title. Then Lewis starts making adjustments, starts looping his punches. A cut opens up on Vitaly Klitschko. Lewis escapes. I agree with everyone who says Lewis escapes. That's what great fighters do in tough moments. Speaking of Vitaly, 
I think he's a great fighter. Right? I know Vitaly panicked against Chris Bird. Agreed. Right? I don't dispute that at all. But wow, you want to talk about a guy who knew how to lean his body. Lean back, have shots blow by him, come back. Who could catch shots on his arms. You want to see a masterpiece? Look at him against Chris Ariola. Folks, that's a masterpiece. Right? You want to see him with a jab. You don't even think of him as a mover. He's in against Sam Peter, who dropped his brother multiple times in a fight. Right? Vladimir wins the fight. But let's say Sam Peter was alone. Not against Vitaly. Right? You want to see a guy who is completely shell-shocked during a Vitaly Klitschko fight. Beaten up. Battered. Right? Then I encourage you to look at Vitaly against Shannon Briggs. Now, I mention Lennox Lewis. I mention Vitaly Klitschko. Because from this seat, those are the two fighters of the last, I'd say, I don't know, 24 years or whatever it is, who are great fighters at heavyweight along with Tyson Fury. Right? Fury, I know he's had tough moments. Welcome to championship boxing. Yes, he has a problem with smaller guys. Yes, he was slower than Steve Cunningham. He gets dropped by Steve Cunningham. Agreed. Right? I'll agree. There's some questions about his chin. I'll even go so far as to say he shouldn't be the lineal. Should have lost his last fight. I'm watching him against Otto Wallen. He has a terrible cut, right? No doubt the referee in the Vitaly Klitschko Lennox Lewis fight would stop the fight. He has a terrible cut. They look at the cut. The cut looks terrible. They let the fight continue the next round. The cut's bleeding about 10 seconds into the next round. In other words, the first time Valen hits the cut, you see blood just pouring down, right? You were looking at all the blood pouring off Tyson Fury, and you were wondering, does he have enough blood left in his body to finish the fight? They should have stopped the fight on cuts. No question about it. Otto Wallen, whatever you think of him, in my opinion, should be the lineal champion right now. But yet, even in that fight, you saw Fury go from being on his back foot to being on his front foot. You saw Fury collapsing the pocket. You saw Fury shortening his punches. Those are things Deontay Wilder can't do. Simply can't do. You saw Fury doing things that, quite frankly, Anthony Joshua can't do. Make no mistake, Fury, when he's dancing, can hurt you. Anthony Joshua, by contrast, when he's dancing away from Andy Ruiz is moving away from Andy Ruiz. He's not there to hurt Andy Ruiz. Right? Fury understands the word combination. We seem to have gotten away from that. Right? It's as if Ali never existed. Right? The heavyweight division is very deep. You want to see a great punch? Sonny Liston's jab. You want to see another great punch? George Foreman's jab. You want to see another great punch? Lennox Lewis's jab. Right? We know all of those guys for right hands. We know all of those guys for power. Right? Floyd Patterson fights Liston twice. I don't think Patterson makes it to the second round in either fight. They're counting the seconds to see, <laughs> to see if Patterson did better in a second fight than the first fight. Doesn't make it out of the first round in either. To be a great heavyweight, you need to have several modes of attack. You cannot rely on a long, straight right hand. You just can't. Right? You need to be able to win slow rounds. Lennox Lewis is in against David Tua. Right? Tua was viewed as a beast. Lennox Lewis slows down the fight. 
He's shooting a jab. Lennox Lewis didn't have to be heavy punching Lennox Lewis that fight. He was able to just keep to a outside outclass. Right? You know. You know. In this fight coming up, only one guy can do that. It's not Deontay Wilder. The fighter I expect to leave the ring unbeaten in this rematch is Tyson Fury. Right? I think Tyson Fury is a great heavyweight. Not just a current heavyweight. Right? I view Tyson Fury as more than Deontay Wilder, Anthony Joshua, Dylan White. I think Tyson Fury has length, he has coordination, he can be up on his toes, he can come inside. Now this rematch, to me, has a historical precedent. And it's the first Evander Holyfield Mike Tyson fight. Understand, the Tyson who fights Holyfield is well past prime Tyson. This isn't the Tyson who ran roughshod through the heavyweight division before Buster Douglas. But understand, even when Tyson fought Holyfield, and this is the first fight, not the air-biting fight, even when Tyson fought Holyfield, we viewed Tyson as a big puncher. The feeling was that Holyfield was going to have to move away from Tyson. Holyfield was going to have to be in survival mode. He was going to have to pick his spots. Wasn't that the feeling? Then the fight started. And Evander Holyfield showed you why he's a Hall of Famer. Holyfield comes inside. He doesn't stay outside on Mike Tyson. He comes inside. He has his head. He's a taller man. Think about it. He's a taller man. He has his head around Mike Tyson's chest. He's channeling Timothy Bradley against Devin Alexander. He's channeling Andre Ward against Mikael Kessler. He's up close on Tyson. He's not moving away from the heavy puncher. He's coming inside on the heavy puncher. Now let me just say this. That fight's interesting because it's close early, then the dam opens up. Evander starts teeing off on Mike Tyson. You knew who the winner was well before that fight ended. You understood that Mike Tyson couldn't cope with a guy up in his grill with his head right here up on Tyson. Tyson complained after the fight that he was head-butted. Now the secret to the rematch is that Tyson Fury has had more time now to prepare. This isn't the guy out of rehab who's fought two guys in witness protection who then gets a crack at the lineal and takes it even though he knows his timing and game is not quite where it was. Right, this is a Tyson Fury who's actually fought other fights, who's been back in the game now for a longer period of time. Right? I believe Tyson Fury, like Evander Holyfield, needs to come inside in this fight. Let me also say this too, and it's a secret to me to fighting Deontay Wilder. You can't have your hands up like this. Think Malik Scott against Deontay Wilder. You can't have your hands up like this because Wilder's accurate. Wilder can split the uprights. Doesn't Malik Scott have his hands up like this? Doesn't Wilder find a way to hit him on the chin? Doesn't he? Right? Wilder doesn't want to waste that right hand on body shots. He wants to hit you on the chin. He's coming after your chin. So to me, look at the defensive guard 
that Tyson Fury chooses. I believe what Tyson Fury has to do is he has to copy Archie Moore, George Foreman, Kenny Norton. Rather than have a defensive guard like this, where Wilder might be able to throw the right hand right between it, right? Hit him on the chin. What Tyson Fury needs to do, and he needs to do it from a right-handed stance, it doesn't work from a left-handed stance if you're inverted, if you're naturally a righty. What he has to do is he has to take this hand and he has to place it here. The idea is to catch the right hands that Deontay Wilder throws while keeping your left hand free to throw hooks, to throw jabs, to set the distance. Right? Tyson Fury got rid of Ben Davidson. Freddie Roach was in the corner of that first fight. Freddie Roach was telling Tyson Fury to go inside. That's not what Ben Davidson wanted him to do. I believe he needs to come inside here. You want to know another guy who fought like this on occasion? Joe Fraser, who I believe would beat Deontay Wilder. Right? To Wilder Nation, to the bomb squad. Name the fight here in the comment section to this video where Wilder is backing up when he lands his straight right hand. I can't. Do we know whether Wilder can land that straight right hand backing up? Isn't the challenge for Tyson Fury, and don't get me wrong, I expect Fury to mix it up. Right? If Fury wants to dance a few rounds, bank the rounds, get ahead on the scorecards, go for it. But all I'm saying is Fury, who's better on the inside, isn't this a guy who has fought and beaten Derek Chisora already? Fury, who's better on the inside than Deontay Wilder, should make this an inside fight. If he goes like this and just starts to move his head, and if this hand's throwing hooks up top and hooks to the body, think about it. Wilder's 6'7 and weighs 220. How much fat does he have on his body? If he doesn't have a lot of fat on his body, if you're throwing shots to the liver that are practically hitting the liver, why wouldn't you do that? You want to fight where Tyson Fury comes inside, shortens the distance, realizes that he can't be outside, decides to come inside and is leaning on a guy. Tyson Fury 6'9". He should be throwing his weight around. He should be spending time watching George Foreman tapes, especially the Foreman who comes back. Right? KOs, people like Jerry Cooney during that comeback. Foreman had some great fights on that comeback. Well, what I want people to do is to look at Fury's fight against Otto Wallen. He's outside, he's dancing around, he has a bad cut. He understands if he's outside, Valen can work that cut. So he comes inside. He practically puts that cut up against Valen. He shortens the distance. He shortens his punches. Somebody in the comment section of this video tell me why he cannot do that against Deontay Wilder. Let's revisit the 12th round. You know what? The 12th round of that first fight's interesting. Because after he gets off the canvas, if you started the round after Fury gets off the canvas, he wins that 12th round. I'm not saying he should win the 12th round, right? He's knocked down. He barely beats the count. Right? He's hit twice on the way down, right? Um, Wilder hits him with the right hand, comes up, hits him with the left hook while he's falling. 
right? That's a 10-8 round for Wilder, no question about it. But just to understand, when Fury gets off the canvas, Fury wins the rest of the round. The knockdown's unfortunate because Fury, sensing that he's won the fight, gets sloppy, drops his hands, thinks he's under Wilder's punches. Look at the film. You'll actually notice he tries to bob his head like this. Right? Doesn't have a hand up. Wilder has him right in front of him. Wilder's able to throw the punch with power downward. Right, that 12th round is an example of sloppiness. I'm sure Fury thought he was several rounds ahead, started taking risks in that 12th round. Well, understand how different that 12th round would have been if Fury decided he wanted to tuck his head like he does and instead takes two steps forward. Right? After Fury is knocked down, by Steve Cunningham and realizes he cannot fight the cruiserweight from distance, right? That's his Achilles heel. It's smaller fighters who are fast, who can move. That's why Usyk's such a big threat to Fury. But what does Fury do? Pull out the Steve Cunningham tape. Fury starts running inside on Steve Cunningham. Literally, starts running inside doing bully moves. Starts acting like an offensive lineman in the NFL. Right? Ends up winning that fight by stoppage. Why can't he do that? Against Deontay Wilder, who's the fighter who came in on Wilder and stayed on his chest? How would... Evander Holyfield fight Deontay Wilder. Understand, Holyfield arguably beats Valuev. I, I thought he did before David Hay beats Valuev. They gave the decision to Valuev. Understand, that fight, Holyfield's on his back foot, moving around the ring. Hay copies his style. Right? But we know Holyfield against Tyson twice is on his front foot, up on Mike's chest. Tyson, who's much scarier up close than Deontay Wilder, couldn't get Holyfield off his chest. How do you know that Wilder, who isn't a gifted body puncher, who doesn't have a great left hand, who needs space to throw his right hand, how do you know that Wilder is going to be able to get Fury off of his chest if Fury decides to come inside. Let's talk about the odds to this fight, because I know it looks hard to bet. It's not, but let's, let's talk about it. I've seen a minus 110 on both sides, right? Wilder to win, minus 110. <laughs> right? Fury to win, minus 110. Someone's thinking, how can I hedge this? Well, let me ask you. Who did you think won the first fight? You can leave this information in the comment section. I thought Tyson Fury did. I believe Wilder's only chance of winning by decision is to knock Fury down multiple times. Right? He'd have to knock Fury down at least twice. Right? The first fight was a draw, for crying out loud. He'd have to knock Fury down at least twice to get a draw. To win a decision, he'd probably have to knock Fury down three times. You know that because the slow rounds, the boxing gap between the two men shows itself, doesn't it? Right? So, I believe for Deontay Wilder to win this fight, it's more likely that he would win by knockout, isn't it? The over-under on this fight is high. Welcome to Vegas. There's a first fight. It went the distance. Somehow, these geniuses are thinking to themselves, well, let's make the over-under ten and a half rounds for the rematch. You're a boxing fan. <laughs> you understand Wilder's best shot of beating Fury is by KO early. Right? You understand that. 
if he waits too long, if this fight drifts into the ninth or 10th round, he's going to be down by something like nine or 10 rounds. Right, so the play here is to structure the bet. So if Fury wins the fight, you win both halves of the bet. If Wilder gets the KO, you're hedged. You don't lose money. The over-under right now is a plus 110. On the under 10 and a half rounds, which gives you 10 full rounds and half of the 11th. The bet I'm recommending is to take the under 10 and a half rounds. Hedged with Tyson Fury to win the fight. Understand, there is a distinct possibility, given that this is a rematch. In other words, you're starting the fight with a hell of a lot more familiarity of your opponent than you were the first fight. I believe Tyson Fury tries to come inside here. I think Tyson Fury understands if he comes inside, this is an easier fight for him than if he stays outside trying to dodge that long straight right hand for 12 rounds. Right? Have Deontay Wilder show up thinking he's going to go hunting like he always does. Thinking he can have that right hand cocked and the fight's going to be you moving around and him hunting you down. Turn him into the hunted. Treat him like you treated Otto Wallet. Right? You can pace it. You can mix it up. You can come out. You can dance and stuff like that early. Let's remember that first fight, Wilder doesn't get the knockdown until round nine. Right? If Fury wants to come in and try plan A, which is how he beat Vladimir Klitschko, he can come in and he can dance and stuff. But there has to be a part of the fight where he comes inside. Where he decides, okay, we've seen this guy knock down everyone he's fought. What happens if I get in on his chest? Understand, this is that rare opponent that Wilder's fighting, who's actually physically Wilder's height. Right? Most of the guys Wilder fights are shorter than him. Right? The guys themselves might be afraid to come inside, right? You're fighting a guy, suddenly you're in the ring and you realize, wow, this dude is 6'7". Right? The secret to boxing is that sometimes it's the shorter guys who give you problems. It's the guys who come in, or in Mike Tyson's case, it's the taller guy who can bend over and come in on your chest. I think Wilder won't be able to deal with Fury on the inside. Look at Wilder against Chris Ariola. There's a part where Ariola, who's out of shape, this isn't the same Ariola who fought Babyface in New York City, right? Um, I believe that Ariola gets inside starts wailing away, doesn't do it the right way, Wilder's able to grab him and pull him close. Then he starts gyrating his hips and playing to the crowd. Right? Understand, if Fury comes in and has a hand free and the best Wilder can do is to pull him in close and try to clinch him, Wilder's going to get stopped. I like Tyson Fury in this fight. The way I'm playing it is to take the under 10 and a half rounds. So if either guy gets the knockout before the midway point of the 11th round, I'm okay. Right? Hedged with Fury to win. Right? The logic is simply because I think Fury has a chance at a KO. If Fury gets the KO, I win both sides of the bet. More beer for me. If Fury comes in and is sloppy, like he was the first fight, gets himself knocked down in the ninth round, I thought that was ridiculous, then gets knocked down in the twelfth round. If Fury's sloppy, 
finds himself getting knocked down. Because this is a rematch, I think Wilder would then close the show before the midway point of the 11th round. But understand, if I had to pick one outcome, I'm going to pick great over very good. I'm going to pick Tyson Fury over Deontay Wilder. Right? Last 25 years, 24 years, I'd say the three best heavyweights I've seen are Lennox Lewis, Vitaly Klitschko, and Tyson Fury. Right? I don't think Dylan White is competitive. I don't think Anthony Joshua is competitive. Right? Let me just say this in fairness to Joshua. I would take Joshua over Deontay Wilder. Right? Why? Because Joshua hits hard with both hands. <laughs> right? Wilder, to me, isn't a gifted puncher. Rather, he's a guy who has a special punch. There's a difference. Right? I believe when you have gifted punchers in the ring, Daniel Dubois, they hurt you with whatever they throw. <laughs> right? Guy hits you in the body, you're like, oh, man! Guy hits you in the head, you're like, oh! You know, uh, left hand, right hand, up top, down low, you're in pain. With Wilder, I don't have to worry about body shots. I don't have to worry about his left hand. I don't have to worry about his right hand up close. I only have to worry about his right hand on my chin from distance. Right? I'm taking the other guy. I like Tyson Fury in this one. I like the under 10 and a half rounds hedged with Tyson Fury to win. That's how I see the fight. I know this fight has many different opinions out there. I hope you leave yours in the comment section of this video. I know many of you don't believe Deontay Wilder is a Hall of Famer. To the bomb squad, Deontay Wilder is one of the best fighters ever. I know some of you see Tyson Fury as a charlatan, right? A guy whose body is not caught up. A guy who seems to be doing a comedy routine on his way into the ring and after fights. A guy who doesn't seem to be taking the sport seriously. From this seat, he's the opposite. Sometimes the guy who looks like the comedian, think Ali, is actually a great fighter. Right? I believe this is a great fighter with a persona that's supposed to disengage the people around him. Right? I think he'll make his case for why he belongs in the sentence with the Deontay Wilders, the Vitaly Klitschko's, let's go further. The Ali's, the Sonny Liston's. I know Sonny didn't have a long heavyweight reign, but let's face it, much better jab than Deontay Wilder. Can we agree on that at least? Right, much better body puncher than Deontay Wilder. Can we agree on that at least? Right? Beat bigger man, Cleveland Williams. Right? I believe he would handle Anthony Joshua. Just understand, I believe that in this group of heavyweights, it's not obvious on personality. And if you're looking at muscles, okay, sure, Anthony Joshua is chiseled. No question about it. If you're looking at KOs, hard to argue with Deontay Wilder's record. But if you're looking for greatness... I think it's the guy who's popping jokes. I think it's the guy who shows up and he's laughing and he's singing to his wife after fights and stuff like that. Maybe. Just maybe. This guy's one of the best heavyweights of the last 25 years. Don't overlook the idea that Tyson Fury wins this fight by stoppage from the inside. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I look forward to your comments. Thanks for stopping by.